until around ten and nursing a bad head, the result of carousing with Samson the night before. Most everything running through my head was non-productive. I was missing Maria like the plague, for one thing, remembering how fine it had been when the two of us slept in late on a Sunday morning. I was still angry about how I'd been made a scapegoat down south. More important, I felt like shit that none of us had been able to help Maggie Rose Dunn. Early in the case, I'd drawn a parallel between the Dunn girl and my own kids. Every time I thought of her, probably dead now, my stomach involuntarily clenched up, which is not a good thing, especially on the morning after a night on the town. I was mulling over staying in the sack until about six. Lose a whole day. I deserved it. I didn't want to see Nana and hear her guff about where I was the night before. I didn't even want to see my kids that particular morning. I kept going back to Maria. Once upon a time, in another lifetime, she and I, and usually the kids, used to spend all of our Sundays together. Sometimes we'd hang out in bed until noon, then we'd get dressed up and maybe go splurge for brunch. There wasn't much that Maria and I didn't do together. Every night I came home from work as early as I could manage. Maria did the same. There was nothing either one of us wanted to do more. She had gotten me over my wounds after I wasn't widely accepted in private practice as a psychologist. She had nursed me back to some kind of balance after a couple of years of too much cutting up and catting around with Samson and a few other single friends, including the fast crowd that played basketball with the Washington Bullets. Maria pulled me back to some kind of sanity, and I treasured her for it. Maybe it would have gone on like that forever. Or maybe we would have split up by now. Who knows for certain? We never got the chance to find out. One night she was late coming home from her social work job. I finally got the call and rushed to Misericordia Hospital. Maria had been shot. She was in very bad shape was all they would tell me over the phone. I arrived there a little past eight. A friend, a patrolman I knew, sat me down and told me that Maria was dead by the time they got her to the hospital. It had been a ride-by shooting outside the projects. No one knew why or who could have done the shooting. We never got to say goodbye. There was no preparation, no warning at all, no explanation. The pain inside was like a steel column that extended from the center of my chest all the way up into my forehead. I thought about Maria constantly, day and night. After three years, I was finally beginning to forget. I was learning how. I was lying in bed, in a peaceful and resigned state, when Damon came into the room as if his hair were on fire. Hey, Daddy! Hey, Daddy! You awake? What's wrong? I asked, absolutely hating the sound of those words lately. You look like you just saw vanilla ice on our front porch. Somebody to see you, Daddy, Damon announced with breathless excitement. Somebody's here. The Count from Sesame Street? I asked. Who's here? Be a touch more specific. Not another news reporter. If it's a news reporter, she says her name... Jesme, it's a lady, Daddy. I believe I sat up in bed, but I didn't like the view from there too much and lay down quickly again. Tell her I'll be right down. Do not volunteer that I'm in bed. Tell her I'll be down directly. Damon left the bedroom, and I wondered how I was going to deliver on the promise I just made. Janelle and Damon and Jesse Flanagan were still standing in the foyer of our house when I made it downstairs. Janelle looked a little uncomfortable, but she was getting better at her job of answering our front door. Janelle used to be painfully shy with all strangers. To help her with this, Nana and I have gently encouraged her and Damon to answer the front door during the daytime hours. It had to be something important to have Jesse Flanagan come to the house. I knew that half the FBI was searching for the pilot who'd collected the ransom. So far, there had been nothing on any front. Whatever had been solved about the case, I had solved myself. Jesse Flanagan was dressed in loose black trousers, with a simple white blouse and scuffed tennis sneakers. I remembered her casual look from Miami. It almost made me forget what a big deal she was over at the Secret Service. Something's happened, I said, wincing. Pain shot across my skull and then down across my face. The sound of my own voice was too much to bear. No, Alex. 
We haven't heard any more about Maggie Rose, she said. A few more sightings, that's all. Sightings were what the Federal Bureau called eyewitness accounts from people claiming to have seen Maggie Rose or Gary Sinegi. So far, the sightings ranged from an empty lot a few streets from Washington Day School to California to the children's unit at Bellevue Hospital in New York City to South Africa, not to mention a space probe landing near Sedona, Arizona. No day went by without more sightings being reported somewhere. Big country. Lots of kooks on the loose. I didn't mean to intrude on you guys, she finally said and smiled. It's just that I've been feeling bad about what's happened, Alex. The stories about you are crap. They're also untrue. I wanted to tell you how I felt. So here I am. Well, thanks for saying it, I said to Jesse. It was one of the only nice things that had happened to me in the past week. It touched me in an odd way. You did everything you could in Florida. I'm not just saying that to make you feel better. I tried to focus my eyes. Things were still a bit blurry. I wouldn't call it one of my better work experiences. On the other hand, I didn't think I deserved front-page coverage for my performance. You didn't. Somebody nailed you. Somebody set you up with the press. It's a lot of bull. It's bullshit, Damon blurted. Right, Big Daddy? This is Jesse, I said to the kids. We work together sometimes. The kids were getting used to Jesse, but they were still a little shy. Jenny was trying to hide behind her brother. Damon had both hands stuffed in his back pockets, just like his dad. Jesse went down on her haunches. She got down to their size. She shook hands with Damon, then with Janelle. It was a good instinctive move on her part. Your daddy is the best policeman I ever saw, she told Damon. I know that, he accepted the compliment graciously. I'm Janelle. Janelle surprised me by offering her name to Jesse. I could tell she wanted a hug. Janelle loves hugs more than anyone ever put on this earth. That's where she got one of her many nicknames, Velcro. Jesse sensed it, too. She reached out and hugged Jenny. It was a neat little scene to watch. Damon immediately decided to join in. It was the thing to do. It was as if their long-lost best friend had suddenly returned from the wars. After a minute or so, Jesse stood up again. At that moment, it struck me that she was a real nice person and that I hadn't met too many of those during the investigation. Her house visit was thoughtful, but also a little brave. Southeast is not a great neighborhood for white women to travel in, even one who was probably carrying a gun. Well, I just stopped by for a few hugs, she winked to me. Actually, I have a case not too far from here. Now I'm off to be a workaholic again. How about some hot coffee, I asked her. I thought I could manage the coffee. Nana probably had some in the kitchen that was only five or six hours old. She squinted a look at me and she started to smile again. Two nice kids, nice Sunday morning at home with them. You're not such a tough guy after all. No, I'm a tough guy too, I said. I just happen to be a tough guy who finds his way home by Sunday morning. Okay, Alex. She kept her smile turned on. Just don't let this newspaper nonsense get you down. Nobody believes the funny pages anyway. I got to go. I'll take a rain check on the coffee. Jesse Flanagan opened the front door and started to leave. She waved to the kids as the door was closing behind her. So long, Big Daddy, she said to me and grinned. Chapter 31 After Jesse Flanagan had finished her business in Southeast, she drove out to the farm where Gary Sanigi had buried the two children. She had been there twice before, but a lot of things still bothered her about the farm in Maryland. She was obsessive as hell, anyway. She figured that nobody wanted to catch Sinigi any more than she did. Jesse ignored the crime scene signage and sped down the rutted dirt road to a cluster of buildings in disrepair. She distinctly remembered everything about the place. There was the main farmhouse, a garage for machinery, and the barn where the kids had been kept. Why this place, she asked herself. Why here, Sinigi? What should it tell her about who he really is? Jesse Flanagan had been a whiz kid investigator since the day she'd first entered the Secret Service. She'd come there with an honors law degree from the University of Virginia, 
and Treasury had tried to steer her toward the FBI, where nearly half the agents had law degrees. But Jesse had surveyed the situation and chosen the service anyway, where the law degree would make her stand out more. She'd worked eighty- and hundred-hour weeks from the beginning, right up to the present. She'd been a shooting star for one reason. She was smarter and tougher than any of the men she worked with, or the ones she worked for. She was more driven. But Jesse had known from the beginning that if she ever made a big mistake, her starship would crash. She'd known it. There was only one solution. She had to find Gary Sinegi somehow. She had to be the one. She walked the farmhouse grounds until darkness fell. Then she walked them again with a flashlight. Jesse scribbled down notes, trying to find some missing connection. Maybe it did have something to do with the old Lindbergh case, the so-called crime of the century from the 1930s. Son of Lindbergh? The Lindbergh place in Hopewell, New Jersey, had been a farmhouse, too. Baby Lindbergh had been buried not far from the kidnap site. Bruno Hauptmann, the Lindbergh kidnapper, had been from New York City. Could the kidnapper in Washington be some kind of distant relative? Could he be from somewhere near Hopewell? Maybe Princeton? How could nothing have turned up on Suniji so far? Before she left the farm, Jessie sat in her town car. She turned on the engine, the heat, and just sat there, obsessing, lost in her thoughts. Where was Gary Suniji? How had he disappeared? Nobody can just disappear nowadays. No one is that smart. Then she thought about Maggie Rose Dunn and Shrimpy Goldberg, and tears began to roll down her cheeks. She couldn't stop sobbing. That was the real reason she'd come out to the farmhouse, she knew. Jessie Flanagan had to let herself cry. Chapter 32 Maggie Rose was in complete darkness. She didn't know how long she had been there. A long, long time, though. She couldn't remember when she'd eaten last, or when she'd seen or talked to anybody, except the voices inside her head. She wished somebody would come right now. She held that thought in her head for hours. She even wished the old woman would come back and scream at her. She'd begun to wonder why she was being punished. What she'd done that was so wrong? Had she been bad and deserved all this to happen to her? She was starting to think that she must have been a bad person for all these terrible things to be happening. She couldn't cry again, not even if she wanted to. She couldn't cry anymore. A lot of the time, she thought she must be dead. Maggie Rose almost didn't feel things now. Then she would pinch herself really hard, even bite herself. One time she bit her finger until it bled. She tasted her own warm blood, and it was weirdly wonderful. Her time in the dark seemed to go on forever. The darkness was a tiny room, like a closet. She... Suddenly, Maggie Rose heard voices outside. She couldn't hear well enough to understand what was being said, but there were definitely voices. The old woman? Must be. Maggie Rose wanted to call out, but she was frightened of the old woman. Her awful screaming, her threats, her scratchy voice, that was worse than horror movies her mother didn't even like her to watch. Worse than Freddy Krueger by miles. The voices stopped. She couldn't hear anything, not even when she pressed her ear against the closet door. They had gone away. They were leaving her in there forever. She tried to cry, but no tears would come. Then Maggie Rose started to scream. The door suddenly burst open, and she was blinded by the most beautiful light. Chapter 33 On the night of January 11, Gary Murphy was cozy and safe in his basement. Nobody knew that he was down there, but if Snoopy Missy happened to open the basement door, he'd just flick on the lamp at his workbench. He was thinking everything through, one more time for good measure. He was becoming nicely obsessed with murdering Missy and Ronnie, but he thought that he wouldn't do it just yet. Still, the fantasy was rich. To murder your own family had a certain homespun style to it. 
It wasn't very imaginative, but the effect would be 